Good morning. Morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Are you doing good? Good deal. Well, good morning, those who are online as well. We're going to uh, get started, so we can give Johnny as much time as he needs. But the beautiful thing about our new study is time. There's no clock on this thing. We can take as much time as we need, have as much discussion as we need. If we move through this stuff, we're not trying to stick to a 13-week schedule, and I love it. So, um, with that being said, we still want to give Johnny as much time as possible to, to introduce us to First John today. So we'll begin with prayer requests. Um, yeah, go ahead, Tom. I got a prayer request and a praise. First, a prayer request. Uh, Jackie's sister, Sheila, and her husband, Dale, mm -hmm. he fell Wednesday night, and they took him to the emergency room, and he cracked the C1 vertebrae. Ooh, yeah. And while he was in the emergency room, he stopped breathing, and his heart stopped. They had to put him on a ventilator. Friday afternoon, they took him off the ventilator, but that night, his heart stopped again, so he's on a ventilator, and he's getting less responsive to mm. things, so I need to pray. And, um, the praise, they didn't have to cut on my head when they did the biopsy. They took enough off that all they had to do was freeze it real good, so. That's good. Ten four. Keep my, uh, keep Layla in prayer. She keeps, she'll be fine all day, and then every night throw up. And we can't figure out why. Doctors don't know why. So we're probably going to have to do like a GI consult, make sure she ain't got something weird going on. One of the doctors thought it might be similar. Like, remember when Tinley had an interception where intestines mm -hmm. turned inside out? They think that she may be having small instances of that, but it corrects itself. And it's what's causing her to vomit. Mm -hmm. So we got to figure that out. And then Tinley's just sick. So cold, whatever's going, been going around, she's got a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I pulled my back out Wednesday. So halfway through this thing, I get up, start pacing behind y'all. Don't think nothing of it. It just it feels better to stand up and sit down. That's, that's all that's going on. <laughs> Old age, man. All right. I can't wait. <laughs> can't wait. <laughs> it only goes downhill from here. That's what I'm saying. I can't wait. It's just, yes, maybe. Purvis. Her brother passed away yesterday. Okay. She'll be going to Alabama <clears throat> this week, and um, John and Brenda. John and Brenda, yes. Healing and you know John with his headaches and stuff. So. And the four. Brenda is taking her medicine like she's supposed to, so the pain's not as bad. Okay. She was remembering the hip surgery, which isn't as bad as the knee. She told me that on Friday night. I said, "No, you take your medicine, and you'll feel better." <laughs> So she is feeling better from the pain, but she still has some healing to go. Temple. Anything else this morning? I uh, see her go to the hospital last week, so we were praying for her. Okay. And, uh, so she's out, so that's the praise. Okay. <laughs> is she doing good? She's all right. She's still, you know, call it sluggish. <clears throat> she's in good spirits, but she just kind of, she's just slower than she was, but still. Authority. I don't think she's that fully functional yet. She's close, mm -hmm. but she had some some passing issues, and they're trying to get everything adjusted right. Ten four. Yes, ma'am. Put my cousin back on there, Denise Norton. Okay. She um, had surgery on her eyes. She had some film on, and they was making her go blind. Mm -hmm. And they did the surgery, and the surgery did not do Help. what they thought it was going to do. Mm -hmm. So she's got to go through some more tests and try to find out what's going on. Okay. Frank's Aunt Kathleen also, <clears throat> she is two months younger than Ruby, so she's 98, and she's been calling us a lot, um, and she just, you know, she, she, forgets she, calls. she forgets she calls. She's, some of, you know, she hasn't, she's doing okay, but, um, it just sounds like she's going downhill also. So Kathleen Jarrett, she's Johnson now, but <coughs> she was a Jarrett. <coughs> Anything else? All righty, well, let's pray, and we'll uh, turn it over to Johnny. Come, Father, Lord, again, we thank you for today, Father, and this opportunity to come with fellow believers to study your word and to come before you in prayer to ask of you what only you can do and father we pray and lift up all these requests that were made this morning 
ranging from illnesses to healing to various in-betweens. And I'm sure, Father, like myself, there were some that are unspoken. And Father, you know what they are, and we ask that you would work in the lives of each and every one, Father, that you would help us to see you working in each and every instance. And Father, give us the grace and comfort to uh, make it through these trials and these difficulties that we face. And Father, we also thank you for this opportunity we have coming up in a moment where we get to hear from your word, because it's from your word that we learn your character and we learn what it means to live a spiritually filled life. So Father, as Johnny comes this morning, we ask that you would protect his lips from error, that you would bring to his mind all that you have taught him this week and help him to communicate it to us with clarity. And Father, help us to receive it and to receive it with gladness. So we commit this time to you, and we thank you for it. And it's in the precious name of Christ we pray. Amen. Oh, and I had something in my uh, praise. <laughs> Sorry about that, Lord. Of course, y'all know uh, Susanna is pregnant. We found out that she is having a baby girl. Oh, oh. congratulations. All right. Susanna's having a baby girl. Not that that baby girl will be spoiled, but uh, no. <laughs> I just, that's right. I love being a grandparent because you get to give them back, you know. But anyway, yes. Gabe, Gabe's going to uh, take a minute and tell us about the event this coming Saturday, um, his uh, Eagle Project, right? All right, so go, go ahead, Gabe. Tell the folks what they need to know, and don't forget to mention the food. <laughs> Good morning. Um, next weekend on Saturday, the 12th, I'm working on my Eagle Scout project here at the church. We're going to meet... We're going to be removing old dead plants from the flower beds and replacing it with mulch. Um, there's going to be food, um, pizza. Um, you can bring tools if you need, like gloves, um, shovels, just anything like that that you think could help. Yep. Thank you. What time are we starting? We're starting at 8 to 3. It's going to go from 8 in the morning to about 3-ish or whenever we finish. And Good. break it noon for that food that you promised. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Thank you, Gabe. We Thank appreciate you. that. Thank okay. You uh, we put new down? Yeah. Don't forget <laughs> and don't don't forget to sign up. The sign up sheet is in the foyer. I mean, uh, at the back of the church, right? The connect table. The connect table. All right, so sign up so that they'll know how much pizza to get. I uh, I don't eat much, as you can tell, but uh, anyway. Uh, all right. Thank you, Gabe. Appreciate that. And uh, let's, get, let's get going here, guys. Uh, I am some kind of excited about this study in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John that we're going to be doing. A um, uh, couple of items real quick. Our workbook for the class will be uh, by uh, Michael Lefebvre. It's 1st, uh, 2nd, and 3rd John. Who does not have a copy of this book? Because everyone needs a copy of this, okay? Because it has, it is, it is going to be the workbook. If you do not have one, raise your hand. If you're online, just send back, and uh, what we'll do is we'll review that to find out how many more we need to get, uh, Richard, if any, all right? So, and do we have any left? We have a few left over there? Two. Two? Okay, so we've got a couple left over there. So if we need to order more, we'll order more. I'm sure we can get more, you know, of, of these. So, but you definitely need, you need this, this book here. Um, during this study, during this study, we're going to be, as Richard said, uh, we're going to be taking our time. We're going to be digging in to uh, first, second, and third John. Uh, why do we feel like that that is important, that we take our time and that we dig into it? Acts 17, uh, 11. Uh, I've mentioned this to you several times. These were more noble, speaking of the Bereans, the Berean church, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so, those things that they were being taught and true. And we call ourselves the Berean class, and if we are in fact the Berean class, then should, not, should we be students of the word? Should we? All right. The three of us. Okay. Should we be students of the Word? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Very good. All right. Good. Good. I was thinking to myself, well, this isn't uh, this isn't starting out real well here, but uh, but that's okay. All right. I guess I guess um, everyone just assumes that I know that you want to be a student of the Word. Okay. A um, couple of things. 
in, in John, in the book of John, and, and we'll get into the, uh, the background, but in the book of John, in chapter 20, verse uh, 30, 31, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So John very clearly told us in his portrait of the gospel what the intent was of the writing of that. He also told us uh, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that, that he hear us, who, whatsoever, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the, the petitions that we desire of him. Okay, So John gives us a very clear picture of why he's writing this. And he did so in St. John, he did so also in 1 John, and we'll get more into that as we, as we move along. All right, so uh, we'll need a, I'll need a little bit of help this morning, um, as is usually the case. Who will find for me 1 Corinthians 15, 17? 1 Corinthians 15, 17. Phil, thank you. Okay, um, and then who will, find, uh, who will find for me Luke 24, 39? I got it. Thank you, Charles. Uh, and then... Next is Luke 6, 13, and 14. Luke, Tony, thank you. And then Mary Beth, if, if you will, um, Matthew 10, 2 through 4, if you will, please. And John 13, 23. Thank you, Jed. 13, 23. John 19, 26. <coughs> Thank you, sir. 1926. Good. And uh, John 20, verse 2. John chapter 20, verse 2. Okay. Thank you, my friend. Um, and uh, John chapter 21, verses 7 and 20. John 21, 7 and 20. Okay. Thank you, Corey. John 21, 7, verses 7 and 20. Okay, um, so for our study uh, in the book of 1 John, as I mentioned to you, um, our workbook will be, will be this series uh, through Knowing the Bible. We will be using other, uh, Richard, Charles, and I will be using other sources in order to um, bring, the, bring the word to you an explanation. One of the one of the other commentaries I'll be using is by James Montgomery Boyce, uh, um, the Epistles of John, Expositional Commentary. We'll, hear, uh, we'll be using that a bit today. Um, we'll also be using uh, John MacArthur's study notes. We'll be using that. Uh, um, I, will be, I will be using that primarily today because the, of the outline and the structure of that, okay? Um, i Looked at four different ones, okay, and we'll be we'll be referring to our book, but it's not quite thorough enough for setting the scene, the context, the background, all the information that we need to do a thorough study. So we'll be looking at some other information there as well, and then also we'll be using we'll be using uh, Henry's commentary, Spurgeon's commentary, and others along the way. Um, I've mentioned to you before. You can find a lot of this information at blueletterbible.org on their commentary series, so you can find it there. And then I commented this week, and I would encourage you to do one of two things. Either, either one, build yourself a study notebook, okay, that you can refer to, that you can write personal notes in, that you can journal. Anybody, anyone ever done any journaling of, uh, with, of your devotion, scriptures? Anybody ever done that? Okay. Tremendous benefit 
in doing that, guys. Tremendous benefit in doing that. So I encourage you to do that. It might be that you would rather have it digitally, okay? If you want to do that and just create yourself a digital file, you can either take the handouts, scan them into your, into your folder, or into your... Um, um, <coughs> In your worksheet that you, I mean, uh, into your uh, into your documents that you put together for study, or if you want it, I can email you uh, the electronic copies. Okay, that I have. Uh, there are, there may be some cases where I don't have an electronic copy, and so then get, we'll give you a hard copy and you can scan that. Okay, so let's go ahead and kick it off and let's get let's get rolling here. Any other questions about where we're going and how we're getting there? Everybody got it. Great, excellent. Okay, all right. So, uh, the title of this uh, of our series here again is First John. So, if you look at your study material uh, at the first first page on that, uh, also uh, uh, easy easy that we're all working from the same book, so our pages are alike. Uh, Paul sometimes called the apostle of faith. Peter had been called the apostle of hope. John has received the attribution of apostle of love. All the apostles taught Christian faith, hope, and love. Nevertheless, John's epistles are particularly emphatic regarding the Christian calling to love. Out of the, I thought this was very interesting. Out of the 221 instances of the, uh, of the word love in the New Testament, 42 or nearly 20% occur in these brief epistles by John, okay? Um, they're some of the shortest in, in the Bible, but um, no other book in the Bible other than Psalms has more references to love. For that reason, among others, he was noted as the apostle of love. Um, it's his own message that he writes. This is the message we have heard from him, that is, from Jesus. It's Jesus that showed us that God is holy without sin, abounding in love. Therefore, we who have been made the children of God through Christ's anointing ought to cease from sin and grow in love one toward another. He writes, uh, John does, with emotion, uh, emotive, picturesque, and rhetorically amplified style designed to stir the, uh, our hearts as well as instruct our mind. And let's be mindful of that during this study. John, uh, under, and, and let, me, let me remind us that when we talk about John's writing, let's not forget that it was deemed part of the canon of Scripture, which means that it is without error, okay? It was given by God. It was God-breathed word, okay? So if we refer to John's writing, we're not disputing the fact that it is God's word, all right? We all know that. Just want to make sure for anybody who may hear uh, and get a copy of this or, or view it online, okay? So we, we realize, we recognize it's God's word. And so uh, we will be referring to uh, John's writing. The three epistles of John, and this is, again, this is one viewpoint, but it does have some strength to it. Look at the bottom of page seven. The three epistles of John form a, sing, uh, a single package, probably designed to be taken together. First John's the main document of the three. It's essentially a written sermon and lacks the normal salutation. And we're all familiar with the normal salutations of the epistles, right? I, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ to the church, you know, and, and so it, it follows a particular format. Um, I remember my pastor from many years ago, he said, it's interesting that we don't today write letters. I don't know that anybody actually writes letters down today or notes, but, you know, every now and then you can. Um, but uh, but we, don't, we, we sign at the end of it, right? Well, the, the epistles, when they told us who it was, clear, they told us at the beginning, you know, so we didn't have to jump ahead on that. So, so we see that, and we see that in Paul's writings. However, the short letter that we know is 2 John contains elements of a salutation, and 3 John contains personal instructions often included at the end of an epistle. All three thus probably form a single packet together, a cover letter to the congregation, a cover letter to the, pa uh, cover letter to the pastor, and then the main written sermon that is there. Okay? Uh, of course, we'll study them in order as they are laid out for us, okay? So, let's talk a little bit about John. John who calls himself the elder, okay? John who calls himself the elder in 2 John 1 uh, and 3 John 1. 
was likely the longest surviving apostle. His epistles are among the final of the apostolic writings uh, provided for the church in that message that we have heard from him. Okay, we'll come back to that in just a moment. But um, the epistle, uh, again, the epistle of first uh, has always been First John, the first and the largest of these three. The letter does not identify a specific church, location, or an individual to whom it was sent, save, save uh, uh, that's 1 John, uh, obviously uh, 3 John does to Gaius, and, and we'll, uh, we'll get into that in due time. Although 1 John doesn't exhibit, does not exhibit some of the general characteristics of an epistle that was common at that time, meaning introduction, greeting, conclusion, like that, and the salutation. Uh, its intimate note and content indicate the term epistle should apply to it because it is that writing of instruction. In talking about the authorship and the date, um, who had for me Luke 6, 13, and 14? I did. Okay, brother. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve of whom he named apostles. Paul, or excuse me, Simon, who he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, and John, Philip, and Bartholomew. Okay, thank you. So, it doesn't identify by name the author, but since the earliest church, and even those, and by the way, you can read, um, you can go into great detail on those early church fathers and how that they, uh, they never had a question about attributing it to John, the apostle. Never did they have a question about that, all right? So the authorship is, is solid. Uh, strong, consistent testimony of that first church. Um, the, uh, the anonymity strongly affirms the early church's identification of the epistle with John the apostle for, some, for only someone of John's well-known and preeminent status as an apostle would be able to write with such unmistakable authority, expecting complete obedience from his readers without clearly identifying himself. He was well known to the readers, um, and so he didn't need to mention his name. There wasn't a question among those that he was sending the letters to. They knew who the elder was. They knew who this one was, so it was not necessary for him to put his name in it. Okay? So, uh, and uh, again, we're going we're gonna, to... Uh, jump around somewhat, but there's a purpose behind that. Uh, the date, the date of it. The pr precise dating is a little bit difficult um, because there are no historical indications in, in the book. You remember as we went through, just went through Daniel, we talked about, it would say, in the year of Nebuchadnezzar king, in the year of Sire, and it, it gave us these historical pieces that made it very easy for us to put that together. Well, some of what we know about the date really is the absence of certain information that's there, okay? So it's difficult. Church tradition consistently identifies John in his advanced age as living and actively writing during his uh, a time in Ephesus in Asia Minor. Some believe, we'll get into that in a moment, some believe that he was actually in Ephesus as pastor when he wrote it. Others believe that he wrote it prior to his ministry beginning there when he was getting ready to go there uh, or was away at a period of time because of some of the, some of the language that's listed. Um, the tone of the epistle supports this evidence since the writer gives a strong impression that he's much older than, his, the, than the readers. He kept saying, what? My little children, right? And so he wrote to them as, as, his children, as his children. The epistle, John's gospel, reflect similar vocabulary and manner of expressions, okay? So both the, the, um, his, his portrait of the gospel, St. John, that we know, uh, also used some similar language. He also dealt with some of the similar issues in Revelation, as he wrote to the churches, okay, there. So there were some of those. Um, that, by the way, is a, a great companion passage. If you'll read through that, it will enlighten you and, and re-solidify what the issues were there at the church that John was having to combat. And you'll see that uh, in, in the uh, first couple of chapters of Revelation as well. Um, 
again, he, he's, combating, he's combating Gnosticism, which we'll go into depth in in just a minute. Um, he's combating that, and we see that it's the beginning of Gnosticism. Though Gnosticism was not known as Gnosticism at the time of this writing, because the writing typically took place, uh, we believe the writing typically took place between AD 90 and AD 95. Okay, during that time frame. Um, and like I say, we, we, we feel very confident because of what we read in it that it was written to the churches of Asia Minor. Okay, and he was, he was reestablishing his uh, apostel, uh, apostolic, 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 thank you, sir, uh, uh, apostolic, his apostolic leadership. And so that's what he was doing, reaffirming that with this letter. No mention is made of persecution under uh, Domitian, which began in AD 95, and that's one of the reasons that they believe that the persecution element may have been greater, and he may have uh, mentioned that much stronger, uh, where he just, he just basically uh, alludes to uh, persecution. And, and many believe that he would have really settled in there uh, quite extensively, okay? Again, although he's greatly advanced in age when he pens this, uh, John was still actively ministering. The sole remaining apostolic, thank you, Richard, survivor, who had intimate, uh, intimate eyewitness association with Jesus throughout his earthly ministry, his death, his, uh, his burial, resurrection, and the ascension. The church fathers, Justin Martyr, uh, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Eusebius, indicate that over time, John lived at Ephesus in Asia Minor, carrying out this extensive evangelistic ministry there, um, writing, writing at the time there the, the epistles, the Gospel of John, and Revelation. One church father, Papias, who had direct contact with John, described him as living and abiding as, as a living and abiding voice of the gospel and of his time with Jesus. Uh, as the last remaining apostle, John's testimony, highly authoritative in the churches, and of course many eagerly sought a hearing from him because he first, he, he had, uh, was an eyewitness, a true eyewitness to Jesus and because of the length of time that he spent with him. In Ephesus lay the intellectual center of Asia Minor, as predicted years earlier before by the Apostle Paul. False teachers arising from within the own church's own ranks, and they were saturating, saturating them with this prevailing, uh, prevailing teaching that was in error. They advocated new ideas, which eventually became known to, as Gnosticism from the Greek word for knowledge. After the Pauline battle for freedom from the law, as we saw Paul who fought to try and ensure that you were not taking the gospel and saying you had to marry it with the law and you had to do that. No, it's by grace through faith you are saved. Okay, That is where salvation is in. It is not in keeping the law. Otherwise, Christ died in vain because we can't keep the law. We can't do it. So that, uh, Paul dealt with that and dealt with, dealt with the issues there, Gnosticism was a most dangerous uh, heresy, or docetism, as we'll talk about, the, the precursor to Gnosticism at this time. John beginning to combat these, and so that's what we see here. Gnosticism influenced by, was uh, influenced by such philosophers as Plato advocated a dualism asserting that manner was inherently evil and the spirit good. All right, I've given you a handout that says docetism to Gnosticism, all right? Now, if I get a little tongue-tied when I'm talking about docetism to Gnosticism, I think you'll understand why. Try that three times real fast, all right? So let's talk about it. Do docetism, actually, is the pronunciation. Docetism, early Christian heresy that promoted a false view of Jesus, um, of Jesus' humanity. The word docetism comes from the Greek dokin, which meant to seem, okay? Uh, according to docetism, Jesus Christ only seemed to have a human body, okay? Now, if your mind is starting to, to think and you're starting to run to 
1st, 2nd, and 3rd John to some of the scriptures that you studied previously, good, because that's exactly why we get this background information. So we can hopefully put ourselves into that seat there at that church when they first read that letter and have a greater understanding of what John was saying, why he was saying it, to whom it was being said, what the purpose was, and then apply that to our situation today, okay? Now, again, you've heard that before, but it doesn't hurt to reiterate that. So, what do we see here? Docetism allowed that Jesus has been, have been in some way divine, but it denies his full humanity. Hardcore docetists taught that Jesus was only a phantasm or an illusion, appearing to be human, having no body at all. Other forms of docetism taught that Jesus had a heavenly body or some type, but not a real natural body of flesh. Docetism, again, uh, closely related to Gnosticism, most believe that it was the precursor to Gnosticism, which was fully known in the late second, early third century to the best information that we have. The problem with docetism is that it denies the core truths of the gospel, namely the death, the, bur the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. If Jesus did not have a real body, then he did not really die. Okay? Docetism teaches that his suffering on the cross was just a mere illusion. And if Jesus had no physical body, he could not have been have risen bodily from the dead. Without the actual death and resurrection resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have no salvation. We are still in our sins and our faith is futile. Who has 1 Corinthians 15, 17? And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Amen. Okay, so it, it, this heresy, and this is what John is dealing with. On the matter of Jesus' humanity, the Bible could not be clearer. Jesus went out of his way to prove his bodily resurrection. Luke 24, 39. Behold, my hands and my feet, that is by myself, handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. The Apostle John warned the early church against these false doctrine, doctrines here. This is how you recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the Spirit of the Antichrist in 1 John 4. Okay? Make sense? Make sense? Okay? Got it. We, we, know, we know the why. So the early, early church fathers, um, Ignatius of Antioch, AD 35, 107, fought against docetism. Uh, Ignatius rightly taught that if Jesus had not actually shed his blood on the cross, then his death was meaningless. Ignatius saw that there was no possible way to align the deception of docetism with the truth of Christianity. And that's really what they were, these, these were trying to do in, in, uh, in John. They were trying to add it to. They were bringing this doctrine into the church. What, what is the next step after you add it to that when you bring in false doctrine and you add it to it where is that bound to go at some point in time heresy. it's all right well it's heresy it's heresy doing that but what you're going to end up doing in many cases is you're going to end up pushing out the truth altogether so that that's all that you have at that point all you have is heresy it, it begins it begins with primarily having truth and then having some heresy that just is added to it, all right? And by the way, if it's not 100% truth, what is it? Heresy. It's heresy. It's a lie, okay? It's got to be 100% truth. So this is what they were dealing with here. Again, Paul did it with the Judea, but Paul dealt with it primarily with the Judaizers, and John and, 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 um, and others dealt with docetism and this... Uh, this idea. I'm not going to read every detail. That's why I gave you this information and this handout to you. But I will encourage you to spend some time going through this, looking at the references here. Um, again, docetism must be rejected because it's not a biblical view of Jesus' uh, nature. In fact, it stands in flat denial to the biblical truth that we hold near and dear as we as we should. Okay. Um, Say, uh, go ahead, Charles. So, I, this is one thing that a lot of people struggle with: uh, is 100% humanity, 100% God uh, in in Christ. And when we see other places in the Bible, we'll call it Old Testament pre-incarnate Christ, 
and then you have the incarnate in Christ here. Um, I've often asked myself, this is one of the, I'll call it the, the weaker spots of, from a philosophical standpoint, in why docetism can come in, mm -hmm. uh, or, or Gnosticism. But where, as the church, we, we understand he was 100% God, but there was like, we see that there was physical limitations on, because he was human, there's, there's naturally physical limitations on the God side. Mm -hmm. We see that he knows people's hearts. We see that, but where does that end and start? What's those relationships? Have, have, have you thought about that? You're and saying deep into like the hypostatic union to cover all that stuff. You're yes. you're saying you're saying um, in Christ's life, in in Christ's life, where did his humanity stop and his divinity meet? Where did where did it take over? Right, but I think yeah, sort of. But it's the relationship where mm -hmm. we we take that he was if he was fully God, okay, and we, we believe he is. The human flesh would put limitations on him. It, it, mm -hmm. it would have had to. Mm -hmm. Okay, where are those? What do those look like? Do we see them in Scripture so that we can understand it better? Okay, I'm okay. Uh, I'm going to take a stab at that, and then we're going to open it up for discussion because I think that I think I understand where you're going. And yes, um, and it might be it it might be, and I've heard it said that more appropriate than saying that he was 100% man and 100% God would be saying that he's fully man and fully God, okay? Now, does it mean the same thing? Well, in my feeble mind, it does, okay? But, but let, me, let me say this. Um, it falls in one of those categories for me that I accept by faith because I believe the Scripture totally teaches, and I know you do as well, Charles, but, but and, and if there's something that's that clear in the scriptures, that clear in the book, then I accept it by faith whether I totally understand it or not. Right. Now, I'm, I'm like you in, in that respect, which should frighten you, by the way, and that is that if there's something that I don't understand, I certainly want to understand it. Right. And, and uh, I do know that some things I can understand better by more diligent study, right. but other things... According uh, according to the book, there are things that are above our thoughts, and we're not going to. But let me let me uh, let me lead off with this. Let me lead off with this uh, in Philippians chapter two. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, being found fa being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. So where, where was it and what were his limitations, if he had any, in the humanity? We know that he ate. We know that he was hungry. We know that he wept. We know that he cared and had compassion for people. Um, real, real tears, okay. Um, we know that. We know that he rested. So with this body, this body, his body was not such that it went on constantly without him resting, okay? So we know that he rested. We know that there was blood there. So yes, these are, the, these are the things. So in God's divine plan, in God's divine plan, he, uh, he being part of the triune, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the headship, okay, the Trinity, then in God's divine plan, Jesus was, at the place God chose for him to be, or that it was uh, preordained time, i.e., what? Okay, mm -hmm. so that was a limitation that our God does not slip. That's something we have faith in and love, right? And we sure are glad about his that. His are always watching, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and and I like that. Okay, that's one of those places where his humanity is being seen. His God side isn't, and I think uh, sometimes when we look at these docetisms. What they do is they perceptually change from a humanistic standpoint mm -hmm. what the scripture doesn't say. Mm -hmm. Okay? And where like our perception, God, God can't die. We know that. Jesus right. cannot die. But he died on the cross. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he was human. Yes. He, he, was, he was fully human. Right? Yeah. 
from a perceptual standpoint, from a human standpoint, he actually did die. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we understand that. From a God side, he just went up to be with where he came from. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, right. And and he was he came back, uh, being raised from the dead, of course. Right. Mm -hmm. The physical side, uh, the humanity side. I think many times the docetism, Gnosticism, is a misconstrued perceptional view that gets pushed in by hum from a human humanistic standpoint. Mm -hmm. it, it overemphasizes one side or the other. Mm -hmm. um, these heresies, and sometimes yeah. we do the same thing, right? We overemphasize the this part of Jesus, and and maybe take away, right? We add something over here mm -hmm. which takes away from his humanity or his godship, whichever mm -hmm. one, as a result. So, yeah, you know, just something for my readings. <laughs> no, no, agree. Any other any other comments thoughts? Yes, ma'am. One thing that always struck me, and I, I talked to Pastor Cody about it before, but um, what really struck us one day we were reading is that we realized in Matthew 24 that 24:36 it says, "No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father." And that kind of struck me as you know the limitation, but I guess he placed those limitations on himself by being submissive to his Father. Mm -hmm. you know? I don't remember exactly what Pastor Cody's um, explanation of it was, but it made sense to me. But that just really, one day we were just reading that, and it just struck me that that was very odd. But right. I don't think his divinity was hindered by his humanity. I think, as you brought up Philippians 2, he humbled himself by becoming man. Mm -hmm. As a man, in fully human and truly human form, he was obedient to the Father. I've not come to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. Mm -hmm. In the instances where you see him show his divinity, he's doing that in obedience to the Father in those moments. His humanity was not hindering his divinity. Right. Because at any moment, even when he's on the cross, he could call 10,000 angels and gone. Done. He could have done that. Right. But he didn't. Right. Because he was being completely obedient to the will of the Father who sent him. And at times when he forgave sins, which only God can do, when he healed people, which only God could do, that was him being obedient to the Father. His divinity wasn't hindered. Now, I understand, I think I know where he's going with the Gnosticism mm -hmm. and the and docetism is that it's almost like they were trying to make him more God than, they wanted to take the humanity away because it was, as Gnosticism, we're talking about a few minutes, mm -hmm. matter is evil, mm -hmm. spirit is good. So they didn't want any matter to be a part of him. That's right. Because he had to be good. Mm -hmm. You had but it also gave them license to sin all day long, too. And we'll talk about that, too, because of yeah. the craziness they did. Because if matter's evil, it doesn't matter what you do in this body because your spirit's going to leave it. Yeah. It's kind of a the Gnostic belief. But anyway, well, I'm not going to ramble anymore. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> my, my, my point, Richard, was that happens, but it, would, uh, but it happens today inside our church, inside our views of Christ. Yeah. That we, it, and it happens in weird, weird ways that we don't even realize where we push a certain side of God or a certain part of Christ, and we, as a result of pushing that, we leave this side out, which it opens ourselves to heresy. Mm -hmm. it opens, so you're saying we swing our pendulum one way or another? Okay. As our perception, we're not taking it in the fullness of Scripture, in the fullness of Christ, mm -hmm. in our understanding, because we want to harp on this spot. You know, right. a, a prime example in the church today is love. God is love. And he's, mm -hmm. sorry, God is love, and we force that. Well, what have, what have we lost in the process? God is a just God, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. He wouldn't kill no one. He wouldn't do anything harm. Sin, oh, it's no big deal. He'll forgive you. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That, we, we push that off so hard that we lose other sides of the gospel that, you know, church discipline is gone. Yeah. Whatever happened to it. And that's, know? that's, uh, it, and, <laughs> The, one of the other things we're going to see, um, and we may, may get to this today or not, but, uh, but uh, mo most likely not, but that is the, 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 the way that John approached this so passionately. There, uh, John, in his writings here in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, there was a great deal of black or white here. 
You are either here or you are here. And this is one of the reasons he was so passionate because he understood, again, he, God's word, right? Okay, we know how those two work together. But he was so passionate about this uh, heretical teaching creeping in the church because he, as well as the other apostles, knew the damage that it could do. And they just create damage so strongly that he, that he said it is antichrist. That's what it is. It's Antichrist. And so, um, again, we'll get into that. Let's talk about Gnosticism for a couple of minutes because um, I didn't get into a lot of the, the, the beliefs of Docetism, but these, you'll, you'll understand why it was the precursor to that because they align in many of these areas, okay? Uh, again, Gnosticism, second century religious movement, claiming salvation could be gained through a special form of secret knowledge. It was this gnosis, it was this additional enlightening that, that, the early, that, that those who were Christians, if you did not have that, then you should seek to attain that higher knowledge because you didn't have everything uh, imparted to you because you were naming the name of Christ. There's more that you can get. Um, early church, Christian church fathers, Origen, Tertullian, Justin Martyr, Eusebius, Eusebius condemned Gnostic teachers and their beliefs as heretical. Uh, Gnosticism, again, uh, from the word to know. Knowledge is not intellectual, but mythical and comes through a special revelation by Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, or through his apostle. Knowledge reveals or, uh, reveals the key to salvation. Gnostics believe, Gnostic beliefs clashed uh, among those Christian doctors, uh, doc, the Christian doctrine, because the early church leaders um, caused them to get in these heated debates. All right, we see that. Look down to uh, dualism, and again, various various beliefs existed among them, but these were elements of them all. Dualism. Gnostics mm -hmm. believed that the world divided into as the basis for salvation, adherents believe that secret revelation frees the divine spark that's within humans, allowing the human soul to return to the realm of light to which it belongs. Gnostics uh, thus divided Christians into two categories or group. There was the first one, the inferior or the carnal group, and then there is the superior or the spiritual group. Only these in the superior have been divinely enlightened so that they can comprehend the secret teachings and the way of true salvation. And this is what they were bringing in to the church that John was speaking about, uh, speaking against. Okay, we know that Christianity is um, comes. Uh, from grace through faith in Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, okay? All right, and I got, uh, I'm going to take a couple more minutes, and then we're going to have to go. So, um, one, of the other, one of the other areas, a lack of love for fellow believers characterizes false teachers, especially as they react against anyone rejecting their new way, their new way of thinking, okay? Okay. Um, they separated their, uh, their deceived followers from fellowship of those who remained faithful to apostolic teaching, leading John to reply, well, um, to reply that such separated outwardly manifested those who followed false teachers lack genuine salvation. They, they, if, if they were following false teachers and following their doctrine, then they lacked genuine salvation, uh, chapter 2, verse 19. Their departure left the other believers who remained faithful to the apostolic doctrine shaken because if and, and they and they had they had questions about it and they had and it left left some of them shaken because they were so confused. John was trying to actively quench those fires of uh, docetism and heresy so that he could in fact strengthen the brothers and those that were there. Okay. Um, we're going to have to stop today, but that's okay, uh, because guess what? Lord willing, next Sunday, we're going to pick it up again, okay? So go ahead through these, um, this first chapter of your material. Be prepared to study that. Feel free to do any other study that you, um, that you, feel, uh, that, that you feel is beneficial. 
Study First John, study, study the setting so that we all have clarity on where we're going there. Okay? All right? Any other comments? All right, let's stand together then. And who, who closes us out in prayer?